This podcast is brought to you by the ATMS Natural Medicine Week. For more information of events and offers, go to naturalmedicineweek.com.au. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today is Jules Galloway. Jules is a passionate naturopath, speaker, and podcaster. Health wasn't always Jules' priority, though. She lived a party lifestyle for over a decade, but when it began to take its toll on her mind and body, she ditched the busy inner city life for a fresh start in the Byron Bay hinterland. Diagnosed with pyrrole disorder, adrenal fatigue and a couple of pesky gene mutations thrown in for good measure, Jules has learned the importance of nourishing herself, using whole foods, supplements, happiness, gratitude and a good dose of humour. With over 10 years of clinical experience, Jules has made it her mission to help women find their shine again. She's guided hundreds of women through her e-courses and also sees clients individually. And you can find Jules at julesgalloway.com on Facebook and Instagram. But firstly, I'd like to warmly welcome you, Jules, to FX Medicine. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Now, we met you, or I met you first, at the Biocytical Symposium 2018. And you were on a panel speaking about the importance of things that you need to do to take your business online. But first of all, I want to get a little a little history from you. So how long have you been a naturopath and was the party lifestyle an integral part of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I kind of smoothly transitioned from one to the other. Uh, but yeah, it was in my, especially in my early 20s, it was a fairly hectic lifestyle. I was the kind of person who went out on Thursday night and might not come home until Saturday or Sunday. Uh, and obviously that didn't agree with my body after a while, and I started to suffer a lot from that. And um, even though it was fun at the time, and I'm glad that I did it, uh, you can't do that stuff forever. And I had a couple of, you know, a couple of rude awakenings where I realised my body wasn't going to hold up, and I was also living on a lot of junk food and alcohol and. I had to become interested um, in order to to sort myself out. I had to become interested in eating well. Um, I gravitated more towards organic foods, whole foods. I learned about gluten-free. I learned about dairy-free, sugar-free. And I had to because otherwise my body was just going to crash and burn. Uh, So that that was the, uh, you know, the misspent youth. (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, as I started to heal my body and as I started to become more interested in in that way of life and I was taking some herbs and some supplements uh, and I realized that I wanted to be able to help other people to get better as well because, yeah, as my body started to heal, I realized my mind started to heal as well and I, I didn't realize that all of that was connected, but... You know, the anxiety went away and the depression started to ease and I thought, there's something to this. And, and once I sorted myself out, I wanted to help others. So I, I did what, what any good person would do and they, you know, signed up to study naturopathy. So off to the Southern School of Natural Therapies in Melbourne I went and I graduated. I finished at the end of 2005. So I've been a naturopath since the start of 2006. Yeah. And uh, I was a naturopath in Melbourne for a good few years. And I worked in a clinic. I worked at a place that many would remember called Macro Whole Foods in the dispensary there. I worked in drug and alcohol rehab at a place called the Raymond Hayter Clinic as their naturopath. So I did lots of very interesting things. Uh, and then I moved into corporate naturopathy. So I was working for a couple of key vitamin supplement companies, uh, done research and development, I've led sales teams all of that sort of stuff, and I started to burn out working in corporate, and I ended up with adrenal fatigue, I ended up feeling very sick and ill again, and I didn't understand why, because I was still taking all the right supplements, but I was feeling worse and worse, and it wasn't until we moved up to Byron Bay for a bit of a sea slash tree change Mm. that we discovered, my husband and I discovered farmers markets and whole foods, and I realised that 
all of those beautiful, wonderful, high quality practitioner and supplements that I was that I was taking every day can only do so much if your diet isn't quite right or if you're not eating the right foods for you. And then when we came up here and discovered all the beautiful produce up here and I got back into cooking because I had time on my hands again. Okay. I realised that if I'm going to move forward as a practitioner, I need to encourage people to eat well and discover cooking from scratch and all of those sorts of things as well as just prescribing herbs and supplements. Can I ask, Jules, so I just want to go back to like, you know, the childhood, the family stuff. And were you in your, you know, your angsty phase of teenage and young 20s? Presumably you're working and I understand you were in Melbourne at this stage. So was it, was it this real disconnect? We, or did you have, did your family have an original affinity, an affinity for good food and healthy eating that you just went, so you just went off? It was, it was an interesting mix actually, because I grew up in a very 1980s white bread, wheat bix you know, margarine family. Mm. My dad got diagnosed with high cholesterol, so then we were skin milk with, with our wheat bix <laughs> uh, And then my my mother and my brother got diagnosed with celiac disease, which was incredibly unusual in the 1980s. But it was at the point where some doctors said outright to them, we don't believe in celiac disease, which we now know. Oh, you're was, kidding. Was, no. So I've seen all of this stuff before. So, you know, now when I see doctors who say we don't recognize pyrrole disorder, I'm like, yeah, you'll come around. I've seen, I've seen this before. I've seen this. I've been there. Uh, so, so yeah, we. it was an interesting lifestyle, but I also had um, – it wasn't the greatest uh, situation growing up. I actually left home when I was 16. So I was I was actually homeless for a little while, and that made for a very colourful end to my teenage years, shall we say? Yeah. Uh, so going back to uni to study naturopathy was a, a really really big thing for me because I'd been out of that loop for a very long time, and um, obviously my teenage years didn't make for a very good, uh, a very uh, shall we say conducive environment for studying your your VCE or. Um, the year eleven and twelve. So, yeah, it was it was a very it was a very interesting upbringing that I had, and it paved the way for a lot of things to come. Uh, and yeah, it also I, I inadvertently also got to have that uh, healthy questioning of the conventional medical system because I saw what happened with my mum and my brother gotcha. uh, with their digestive issues and their, you know, the way that they had to go about getting diagnosed with celiacs. And meanwhile, my mum was having, you know, whole areas of her bowel removed in operations, oh. in surgery, oh my because the, the damage to her, her digestive system was so great. Yeah. And there were gastroenterologists and doctors along the way who were like, no, celiac disease is not a thing. You can continue to eat whatever you want. Luckily, they they did go gluten-free and it did help them somewhat. But back then, we didn't know about gut healing. We didn't know about the mind-gut connection in the way that we do now. So, you know, there were a lot of of issues. If I could go back 30 years, uh, (laughs) there would be a lot of things that, that the family would probably have done differently. I've got to ask you about your drug and alcohol work because I I remember my drug and al- alcohol part of nursing and I absolutely adored it. Met some fantastic people. But can you explain to our listeners how you got into drug and alcohol work and indeed what you saw the people you met in that work? Yeah, I kind of just fell into it. The opportunity arose and I nearly didn't take it because it was my first year out after graduating. And the person that I was taking over from, the person who'd done the job at this particular place before me, I had uh, I, I knew him as a lecturer. I thought he was amazing, and I thought I cannot fill those shoes. Like who am I to fill those shoes? It was like massive imposter syndrome going on like that. I can't do that job. He's been doing that job, uh, but I decided that it was a good opportunity, so I put on my big girl pants and off I went, and I absolutely loved it. I absolutely, it was one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, I'm not I, I'm not intimidated in those sorts of situations. I've worked in bars. I've, 
like you know, it's when you when you've had a bit of that kind of misspent news going on, you you see a lot of things. So I think I actually was the right person for the job because I walked in and there were people coming off heroin, there were people coming off ice, and I was like, I wasn't that phased. So I I loved communicating with all the different people who came to rehab. Uh, we had a massive mixed bag. We had kids straight out of Turak College mixed with, you know, blokes who'd, who were up for armed robbery and the magistrate, the ma- magistrate said, you can either go to jail or rehab, you choose. Right. And that shows rehab. Yeah. So, and we had everything in between. We had a lot of chefs, funnily enough. Yeah. <laughs> we had a lot of, we, we had people from every walk of life all living under the same roof, all coming off the same substances. And I loved working with, you know, with all those different shades of grey in life. And um, I think it sets you up to be able to talk to anyone as well going forward. That's interesting. I, I think one of the main things, though, Jules, is that being down there, having done that, you know better than most people what it's like to be a patient. Yeah. And so this is something that it's really hard for somebody who's lived the pure life all their all their life to know what people are going through, to know what challenges they're facing. And I think yeah. this is real key to being a successful carer, practitioner, whatever, even a parent. Um, so were you always cognizant, though, of I've been there, I've done that, so this is nothing that phases me, Is like when you were studying naturopathy? Uh, I think having lived a colourful life before I, I went back to study, I think it I kind of, I'm one of those people, I guess you would call a sampler of life. I just wanted to try everything that life had to offer, you know, good, bad, ugly, whatever. It's like, yeah, I'll I'll try everything. Uh, And I I think that sets you up for seeing what, when you see what life has to offer, you also meet a lot of different people along the way. And I think that helps with empathy. A lot about, a lot about being a good practitioner is about having an open mind and having empathy your patients, uh, and so it, because that helps you to be a supportive practitioner, I think patients can tell when they're being judged. They really can. Uh, and if someone's feeling judged, they don't open up and tell you the thing that might be the one thing that you needed to know to put the last piece in the puzzle to be able to know exactly what that person needs or to know what to do. And so if if you you know for me getting out and living my life in that way before knuckling down and, and you know, straight, straighten up and fly right. <laughs> it's, you know, being able to go out and live a colourful life before all of that, it allowed me to have empathy for people no matter what their situation is, no yeah. matter where they're at. Yeah. Uh, I can I can have a, a an appreciation for how they got there and why they're stuck. Yes, and indeed you can teach people to change because you have yourself. Yeah. So yeah, here we go. I, <laughs> <laughs> How did you? What What was the thing that that made you change? You were you were speaking earlier about the attraction that you had to the organic food and lifestyle and the sort of you know the forest sea change of the Byron Bay hinterland. What was the awakening to say this is good? I went out and had a really big night out and got to a point where I realised that I was going, if I kept going down that path, that I was going to seriously hurt myself. Right. So it was that rock bottom point. Well, I don't have addictive genes. I've, I've done all my, I've done my gene testing and I don't, yeah, I, I don't believe that I have addictive genes, uh, so to speak, but um, not like when I was working in rehab and I saw people who could not stay away from something. No. no matter how hard they tried, they kept going back and kept going back. And yeah. I don't have that. Uh, so I think there are there are worse rock bottoms. I think the rock bottom that I hit is not as bad as the rock bottom that some people hit. But I, I got to a point where I had a massive awareness one evening of exactly... You know, I was, it wasn't, and it wasn't just the partying, it was like the cigarettes and the junk food. Like yeah. I was eating crap food, I was eating McDonald's, I was smoking, all of those things. And, and I, I remember that night I was having a cigarette thinking, I know what this is doing. It was like I had this moment of clarity of yeah. this is, this is really harming my body. And is this the path that I want to walk down because at some point it's going to make me sick to the point of no return? Jules, I want to go on to how you 
took your business online? Because you do a significant part of your business online, correct? Yeah, yeah. Most of it's online. And how did you move over? I mean, obviously started off seeing patients on a physical basis. How did you move over? What was your initial attempts like? And what things did you learn from? Perhaps some mistakes that you made. Do you know what? When I moved up to Byron Bay, I had no intention of seeing patients one-on-one. I was so burned out from working in corporate as a naturopath in Melbourne. I was so tired. I was so adrenally fatigued. I was right I was right at the end of my tether and I came up here for a rest and I thought, I'm just going to, I don't know, work in a health food shop or something and figure out what I'm going to do later. Like I was that far gone. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of people have moved to Byron. <laughs> they come here to heal and they come here to rest. That's why people are drawn here sometimes. Yeah. I got here and the last thing on my mind was private practice, the last. Uh, I wanted to start a blog through, through a series of events where a cousin of mine uh, contacted me about her two-year-old daughter who had complete failure to thrive reflux was throwing up after every meal, was about to have a gastroscopy to look for what's wrong. And she rang me because she asked me, uh, she wanted to know what can we do, what can we give her over the next few weeks to help her get the least side effects from having this procedure done because she's two and she's weak and Mm. even a gastroscopy was scary. And I, I said to my cousin, listen, how many, how many weeks have we got? I think it was actually up maybe three or four weeks before she was going to have this procedure. And I said, all right, can we just get her off the gluten, the dairy, the sugar, and the eggs? And like there was a big conversation around that, and they didn't want to do it, but they did. And I said, just do it for a couple of weeks. No gluten, no dairy, no eggs, no sugar, for just a, just a couple of weeks, and let's just see what happens. Um, and within 48 hours, she rang me back, and she's like, it's a miracle. She stopped throwing up. She doesn't throw up after. She's thrown up after every single meal, three times a day, for two years. Wow. And she said, She's no longer throwing up. It's 48 hours after starting this. Like, seriously, I still get emotional thinking about it because if it wasn't for that, I don't think any of my online business would have happened because in the end what happened is now, like, we got her, we ended up getting her to a local naturopath to work with, but the first step was getting her off those foods. And my cousin said to me, why isn't this information out there? I've been Googling, I've been looking for answers, you know, looking up reflux, in children and blah, blah, blah. Why didn't anyone tell me to take her off the gluten, the dairy, the sugar, and the eggs? You need to start a blog. <sighs> and that's how it happened. <laughs> da, 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 da. Thanks, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> that was in 2013, 2012, late 2012, early 2013. And I was sitting here with my slightly too early midlife crisis because um, I was only in my late 30s, um, sitting in here in Byron Bay going, what the hell am I going to do with my life? I don't want to go back into private practice. I know, I'll start a blog that's all about food intolerances. And from there, I did a business course called Marie Folio's B-School, which is an online business course that teaches people how to take their passion and turn it into an online business. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, everything just started to gradually explode, and I still wasn't seeing patients one-on-one. I was like, you know what, I'm going to sell e-books, I'm going to do e-courses, I'm going to monetize my blog, I'm going to do anything apart from private practice, and then the requests started coming. Like, the more the blog grew and the more readers I got and the more people who were following it, the more requests I got, do you see clients? Do you see clients? Do you see clients? Can we see you? Can we see you? And I'm like, oh, my God, I have to get my insurance up to date. I'm going to have to do all this stuff again. Like, I really, I'm so burned out. I didn't want to do this. But the request kept coming. Do you see clients? Do you see clients? We'll pay. Yeah. We'll pay lots of money. <laughs> we really want to see you because we like the way that you write on your blog and now we feel like we've got this connection and we, we really just want to see you. And I was like, I wonder if I could see people via Skype. Because the last thing I wanted to do moving to a new town from Melbourne was to – a shingle out the front and be in, you know, in inverted commas, in competition with the other local naturopaths. I didn't know the lay of the land. I didn't know who these people were yet. I didn't want their first experience with me to be me trying to get clients in a country town <laughs> um, because I didn't want them to think I was cutting the grass, basically. Yeah. So 
I kept a low profile and I focused on seeing people via Skype because I thought if Byron Bay is a bubble, and Byron Bay is often referred to as the bubble, right, because we've got a very high incidence of turmeric lattes, coconut milk, coffees, you know, acai bowls and nappy fats, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if Byron Bay is a bubble, what if I just fish outside the bubble? And so I started running Facebook ads to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, um, mining towns. Yeah. Like there's mining towns who don't have naturopaths. No, I know. I know a couple of naturopaths that have had a very su- successful and satisfying career looking after miners because yeah. nobody looks after them. partners. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's so many pe- there's people and places out there that are in great need of mm. naturopaths who don't have anyone locally. And also because I was on my blog speaking a lot about chronic fatigue and adrenal fatigue and all of that stuff at the time, I was also getting people in capital cities who were too tired and too broken to really be able to get in the car and drive to a naturopath. Mm. So it was like a virtual house call. They can sit in their pyjamas on their couch on Skype with their two kids running around who are under five years old who they're like, oh, thank God I didn't have to bundle them in the car to come and see you. Right, that's that's... That too became my client. Can I ask you about the the responsibility, though, of things like diagnostic tests? And indeed, let's go back to the the first patient that you painted. Um, you know, if you're talking about, let's say, something like eosinophilic esophagitis, like it's a really horrible disease, even to try with an expert to try and diagnose. What do you do about diagnosis? I encourage them to go and see somebody locally if it's something that I can't diagnose online. Right. Um, Skype's amazing. You can look them in the eye. You can see their skin tone. You can see their hair. You can get them to send them photos of their nails. You can get photos of their tongue. A lot of that stuff that, you know, people say, oh, you know, it's Skype. You can't look at their nails. And I'm like, yeah, you can. You've just got to be prepared and organise and get them to send you pictures. But when it comes to something where that you need that clinical hands-on evaluation, I send them back to their GP. Yeah. Yeah, or on occasion, if if I think that it's outside the scope of what I can do online, I have a network of naturopaths that I will refer them to. I have absolutely no problem with referring someone to another naturopath because I know that over time what goes around comes around and I have an abundance mindset now rather than that closed off competitive mindset that I think some practitioners fall I'm into. I'm so glad you bring that up. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that serves me well. I've got some very wonderful practitioners in, you know, I've, there's, for example, I, I refer people to Carla Rent down at Peninsula, herbal dispensary in Melbourne. Um, she's got someone working with her called Kimberly Taylor, who's a, uh, who does yep. a lot of paediatrics. Yeah. I don't see children via Skype. Yeah. <clears throat> Will not ever, right? Mm. Mm. So if someone's in Melbourne who needs help with their child, straight to Kimberly. So if if someone is down that way and wants to see a naturopath face to face, or if you know if it's an oncology or a really complex autoimmune case, I know that's something Carla's amazing at. No worries, Carla has sent people to me. So are things that she knows I can look after well. You know, if there's a if there's a client that she feels would be better served by me, she's got no problem sending them to me. Yeah. We've literally shared clients with each other. That's how it should work. And I'm starting to I'm starting to find that I can do that in other states with other people. So uh, I love connecting with naturopaths and finding out what they do. And then if I need to send someone to them, I've got no problem. Um, referring on because I know that in time that'll come back to me as well and and it, it, it creates that collaborative environment where everyone starts to thrive more. Jules, I've got one last question to ask you, and that was that at the 2018 Biocertical Symposium, you um, we dragged you up on stage to attend a <laughs> panel, <laughs> um, to attend a panel, and one of the other people there was Robbie Clark, who was speaking about online security. 
And he yeah. brought up some really, really good points. Indeed, I've recently just podcasted with him about this security online issue. Um, what's your thoughts on what you heard from that um, with regards to patient records, what's actually yours and what's not? Um, and indeed, what could be hacked? Hacked. Yeah, it's a bit of a minefield and the Australian guidelines for how the data is meant to be kept, I don't think are uh, strict enough. Mm. So at the moment, we don't, we we, we almost, I, I, my, the way that I see it is that it, I think it needs to be stricter. And so I know in America there's different guidelines for how the data is meant to be kept and, and I think they're onto it a bit more. Uh that, that reminds me, actually. Thank you for bringing that up because I need to hunt Robbie down. Uh, I'm <laughs> in a nice way. <laughs> I've got his business card in my bag somewhere. He's I better a nice bloke. through that. Uh, because I, I want to try out his platform because it sounds like he's got something, he's got a cracker of an idea going on there. And, yeah, I think that any just about anything can be hacked if, if someone really wanted to get in. I mean, if, if, if people can hack NASA, they can hack just about anything, right? Oh, yeah, heck yeah. So, so it's up to us at the moment uh, that, you know, we need to keep those files secure. But at the end of the day, it's a giant electronic filing cabinet, isn't it? And, yeah. I mean, I remember back in the, you know, back in just after being freshly graduated, I had patient files in the middle of folders in a filing cabinet with a lock. But if someone wanted to come and pick that lock, they could. They could. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's so exactly right. I don't, I don't see it as being that different, but I do think at the moment the way that, the way that it's set up in Australia, in Australia, the onus is almost more on us to right. go over and above what the regulations are and to keep that data as safe as possible. Yeah. Jules, just as a last couple of questions, firstly, now that you've grown your business, you're now doing, you know, the majority of it online, people are seeing you, what, but you're a person that gives back. Um, and I can see this, you're a carer from your genes, from your, your mm -hmm. bones. So what are you doing to give back to the naturopathic community? Do we have a gene test for that coming up? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, there are a couple of things that I do to give back. And, yeah, I, I am – because I was homeless when I was 16 and because I did have a very rough start and because there were people along the way who helped me out, I've always wanted to – when I got to a point when I could, I always wanted to give back. And now is the time that I can do that. Uh, so, look, there are a couple of things that I do. I do occasionally mentor people. Uh, a small amount of people at any given time. Um, but rather than the usual naturopathic mentoring of, you know, here's my cases, can you help me tell them what, tell me what to give these patients? It's more I help people who are looking at taking their businesses online or if they're interested in starting a podcast. Um, but also I have mentored people who've got patients with pyrrole disorder as well because that's something that I'm particularly interested in and have done a lot of research on. So they're the things that that I offer to other practitioners. Uh, also, I am involved with a group called Involvement Volunteers International, and we run trips to Fiji four times a year. Yeah. And I'm their Fiji Nutrition Coordinator. So four times a year I go over to Fiji and I take groups of not just naturopaths, but um, we've got doctors, nurses, nutritionists, dietitians, physiotherapists, you name it. If you're a allied health practitioner and you've got first aid and you want to go and help out in, in a beautiful community in Fiji, then definitely, definitely get in touch with me um, because we're doing Fiji at the moment, but we're also looking at other areas as well. So I think we're looking at um, going over to Samoa by the end of this year and possibly I'll be involved in some projects in Bali next year as well. So. Yeah, definitely get in touch with me and we can put you in the loop for that one as well. So, yeah, they're the things that I'm doing at the moment. So they can people can find out more information and if they wanted to join you on these expeditions, julesgalloway.com, is that correct? Yeah, uh, there's, I really should put some more up there about the volunteering stuff. Mm. <laughs> there's not a lot up there for the volunteering at the moment. That website's kind of more aimed at, uh, at you know, clients and, and uh, lay people. but. Yeah. Yeah, I will put something up there. I really should. Um, but uh, if you are interested in volunteering, uh, you can look up Involvement Volunteers International. Just Google them. 
and I think it's volunteering.org.au, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, look up Involvement Volunteers International or just send me an email at hello at jewelsgalloway.com and we can just chat there. Jules, thank you so much for taking us through and, and sharing a lot of your life experiences and where it's taken you and indeed what you're giving back. Um, we'll definitely be putting this information up on our FX Medicine website, so fxmedicine.com.au and Jules Galloway. Uh, thank you so much for taking us through what you've done, what you've been through and what you're giving back uh, on FX Medicine today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's absolutely an honour. So, yeah, it's really enjoyable. Thank you. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. If you enjoyed today's podcast, you can find more Industry Insights podcasts and resources under the Community tab on the FX Medicine website.